minutes. All right, let's. Was it more than three minutes? We're not counting, Aaron, because we love you. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, continue to build us up in things of faith. As we see you at work in your church, we read it in the book of Acts, and we see it today. We thank you for it. We pray that by your Holy Spirit, all is at work in our hearts. You would be praised and gloried, honored, as we learn, as we deepen, as we serve, as we rejoice. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, turn to some of your tables and say, it's hot enough for a Hawaiian shirt. Just say that. <laughs> That's for all those of you talking about my shirt. All right. I learned from Kelly. White shirt. I mean, white sheet. Let's... Uh, we're in Acts chapter 5, but it is going to be very important for us to, to uh, flow into this um, from the previous verses of chapter 4. So I'll begin at verse 32. All, believe, all the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of his possessions was his own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and much grace was upon them all. There were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned lands or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to anyone as he had need. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold the field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. Now, a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You've not lied to men, but to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. And great fear seized all who heard what had happened. Then the young men came forward, wrapped up his body, and carried him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter asked her, tell me. Is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? Yes, she said, that's the price. Peter said to her, how could you agree to test the spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out also. At that moment, she fell down at his feet and died. Then the young men came in, and finding her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. The apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders among the people. And all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade. No one else dared join them, even though they were highly regarded by the people. Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. As a result, people brought the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and mats, so that at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he passed by. Crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem, Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by evil spirits, and all of them were healed. So that's going to be our text for the day. All right, to our notes. Uh, by the way, uh, I would say this. If we, don't, if, if we don't develop every single topic as fully as you might want us to do, I might be uh, leaving some of them by because there are some themes we're going to pick up again and again and again in the book of Acts. For instance, um, it seemed like Ananias and Sapphira wanted to be popular and give a gift, and they mishandled it. Well, we're going to see that a few times later when someone saw Peter doing miracles. He says, can I buy that, can I buy that power? I got money. And Peter said, oh. You know, so then that man was dealt with. That will come up later. So w w what happens in faith where we are mindful of another's gift or how they're praised. We say, I want that too, and you're motivated by self, 
and you're motivated by personal glory seeking rather than the things of God. So we're going to see a lot of this throughout the book of Acts. Don't be surprised if we see these themes again and again. All right. Here we are introduced to specific individuals who, along with their stories, give insight into the general statement of the early believers, that they occasionally would sell property and give it for the well-being of fellow believers. And, and I got to tell you, that happens today. I know people who say, you know what, I don't, I don't need that stock, uh, but I, I want my church, I want my the high school, I want Concordia, I, I, I want it to be blessed, I don't need it. And so a stock or a piece of property or a second home is sold and, and given completely over to a ministry. So we might think, well, we don't live like that. Well, I think we do. And I think to be mindful of how God is at work in every generation is a good thing. All right. The named donors, and their stories, of course, contrast significantly. And that's obvious, all right? But I want to start not with Ananias and Sapphira. I want to start with Barnabas. Barnabas, the cousin of John Mark. And that's a little bit difficult to know what it means because cousin can also be used generically as relative. So I'd say, yeah, that's my relative. Well, who is she? Well, I think she's, let's see, second cousin, or you know how that goes. We all have those kinds of relationships. So cousin here might mean he was cousin of John Mark, or he might have been cousin of John Mark's mother, Mary. It, it's not an issue because we use the words the same way. All right? The cousin of John Mark, and perhaps Mary, Mark's mother, Acts 12. Let's turn there. Acts chapter 12. And that will be in connection with Peter's escape from execution. Verse 11. Then Peter said to himself, or he became alert, and said, Now I know without a doubt that the Lord sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's clutches and from everything the Jewish people were anticipating. When this had dawned on him, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where many people had gathered and were praying. And then later on, we're going to go to uh, chapter 9, 14, and 15. We're going to see that Mark and John, uh, Mark and Barnabas were called cousins. But that's not quite yet. Okay? So Barnabas is named here, back to Acts chapter 5. Barnabas is named here not only for his gift, representing the gifts of many, of course, but because he also has a fairly brief but important role to play in the mission of the early believers. Some speculate that he might already have been a known personality, as possibly he was one of the 72 that Jesus had sent out during his three-year ministry. Let's go back to Luke chapter 10. And here's one of the verses that's not found in Matthew and Mark. When, you, when we've talked about the synoptic gospels, synoptic means with the same view or the same eye set, the same vision. Uh, this is one of the sections only found in Luke, which is, it proves nothing to me, but I find it interesting. I like, I like knowing those things. Verse 1. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. And you can read the rest another time. But there are some scholars and some, I don't say just scholars, I don't mean believers aren't scholars in their own way, but some believe that maybe he was one of the 72, so he was already known. Uh, why else would he be named except that, well, we know Barnabas. Oh, he was one who sold a piece of property? And you can see how the connections are made from this part of Jesus' ministry to this part of Jesus' ministry. And remember from, uh, from Acts chapter 1, when Jesus began his ministry, which means it's not done. So this is still the work of Jesus in his church through his people in the book of Acts. So uh, that's a, a little bit of possibility. Cyprus is an island in the Mediterranean. Some speculate, and I'm answering Kelly Downing's question to me privately last week. He said, I thought Levites couldn't own property. And I said, ah, da ba da ba da ba da You're right, Kelly. I hate to say that. <laughs> no, I don't hate to say that. He's a dear friend. But Kelly was right. I got to think that. I had, to, I had to work that backwards and say, yeah, Levites were not allowed to own property. The other tribes had property, and they would then be generous in order to provide for the Levites' family. They were the priests of the tribes, right? I think we know that from the Old Testament. 
But so much had changed with the, the, the destruction of the 10 northern tribes. They're gone. Judah was brought into captivity in, uh, in Babylon. They're back. So lots had been shifted downward just to say, let's make this work somehow. So I don't know that that's an answer that all of you find satisfactory, but I want to think about that with you for just a little bit. Okay. Some speculate that Barnabas' father gave up his role and rights as a Levite by moving away from the land of Israel. I thought, okay, that's possible. That would explain how Barnabas could have been a landowner, denied to the Levite tribe, but it would not certainly be provable. Then last night, Jane said, because she knew I was dealing with this, should, are you guys okay with that door or should we close it? I'll leave it up to you, Dallas. You choose. Choose for the group. I hope you choose rightly. <laughs> so Jane speculated, and I didn't read this in a, in a, in a uh, scholastic work. It's her. She said, if Barnabas was a son of encouragement, maybe, maybe that was always his way. He was just a, an outgoing encouraging, a positive kind of a person. And is it possible that someone along the way gave him land as a gift of thanks? I thought, I couldn't disprove that. So somehow Barnabas had property, right? We all come back to that in Acts chapter five. He had property, he sold it and gave it for the sake of the church. Here he is introduced to us in anticipation of understanding his selection as Paul's missionary partner. We are also helped by these texts in which we see how highly this man was valued, respected, and trusted. All right, Acts chapter 9. If you think giving a gift of land was impressive, where do you get a hold of this? 23. Saul, also called Paul, is recently converted and serving Jesus. After many days had gone by, the Jews conspired to kill him. But Saul learned of their plan. Day and night, they kept close watch on the city gates in order to kill him. But his followers took him by night and lowered him in a basket through an opening in the wall. When he came to Jerusalem, Paul, he tried to join the disciples, the other believers. But they were all afraid of him, not believing that he really was a disciple. Okay spy, double spy, all that kind of stuff. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him and how at Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. So Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. All right, so that's a very important insight into who this man Barnabas was. He stepped up into what I would call a not dangerous situation, but highly inflammable emotionally. Here's Saul, the murderer, the killer, who almost certainly was the one who was approving of Stephen's death, the first Christian martyr, just a few chapters earlier. Now he's one of them, a believer. The apostles, including uh, not just the believers, but the apostles were saying, yeah, don't know about this. What kind of access did Barnabas have to the apostles when there were thousands of believers? So they apparently had a deeper relationship with Barnabas that they could trust him. And he's the one who said, Paul's the real deal. This faith is real. God's at work. He loves Jesus. Ready to go now in ministry. Up until then, it was, I would say, humanly speaking, it was undetermined if Saul would have a place uh, with the other believers. I mean, he had been that bad in hating and, and attacking and marauding and killing. And if you want to name your next son Barnabas, God bless you on that one. Do you hear me back there? You heard me? Sure, make fun of the Bible. <laughs> All right. All right. Acts 14. Acts 14. 
11 through 14. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, this is healing crippled man, they shouted in the Lyconian language, the gods have come down to us in human form. Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul they called Hermes because he was the chief speaker. The priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, blah, blah, blah. So here's the point. Paul and Barnabas were a team of missionaries, each of whom had stature. Now, Paul seems to have been the main speaker from that text and other texts. But from this one, yeah, Paul probably was the main speaker, and maybe he seemed to be the leader. But Barnabas was not just in the shadows. And they said, well, who's that? Maybe that's, maybe that's a servant of the God. No, they called him Zeus, which is the higher God, because he was fully present. So we have this insight. It's as though Luke, the evangelist, in chapter 5 says, let me tell you something about the Barnabas you already know. Did you know that he was one of those who sold a piece of property and gave it to the, to, uh, to, to the sake, for the sake of the ministry? And they said, well, maybe I didn't know that. But now you've got a fuller picture of who this man was. And then we have... Chapter 15, verse 36, which honestly has never bothered me. But it bothers some people, uh, to me, more than it should. 36. Sometime later, Paul said to Barnabas, let's go back and visit the brothers in all the towns where we preach the word of the Lord and see how they're doing. No, that's, a, that's a nice plan. I like that plan. Okay, Pastoral care. We don't just plant the word of God, the seed of God, but we also go back, see, how are you doing? How can we build you up? How can we encourage you? Okay. 37. Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark, with them. But Paul did not think it wise to take him because he had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in the work. Hmm. Yeah, that would be a problem. Okay. If you go back, in the previous uh, verses and chapter, uh, John Mark, who may have been a very young man at this time. I mean, don't hold me, but maybe early 20s, maybe. That first missionary journey, it was getting dicey. There was some suffering going on. And I think John Mark got a little homesick and said, yeah, I'm going home. Okay. All right? That's not right or wrong. As I view ministry, you're not ready for this. Okay? Barnabas said, I think he's ready for the next mission trip. Paul said, not on your life. I'm inventing words here. I'm creating my own words. But Paul said, no. Uh-uh. Not doing that again. Uh, 39. They had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. Barnabas took Mark and sailed for Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and left, commended by the brothers, to the grace of the Lord. He went through Cilicia, Assyria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. Um, I've, I've never thought it was a big issue when, when Christians have a sharp disagreement with each other and go on and do ministry. I don't, I don't know what the problem is with that. But I know there are some people who say, oh, this was a, this was a blight on the, on the, the, um, in, the, in the name of Christians. It, they had Paul and Barnabas arguing so badly that they hated each other. Well, that doesn't, that's not what Scripture says. Have you ever had a sharper disagreement with someone you loved? Come on. I mean, come on. That's just our nature. I mean, that's just the reality. So I see this as a mature way of solving a conflict. You know what, Barnabas, go ahead, you take John Mark. I, I, don't, I don't think I want to go through that again. Okay, I'll take him. I'll find somebody. Hey, Silas, and now you got another mission. You got two mission teams here going out and doing the work of Christ. And so, but Barnabas is connected here. Barnabas was a major player in the Christian church. All right, so back to Acts chapter 5. It is as though, it's as though the author is saying, I know that you know Barnabas, but let me tell you about this part, his generosity of faith, and see how different it is from the faith of this couple. Ananias and Sapphira's story is told here and only here. We do not know their ages, 
nor whether or not they were parents too. Well, that would really be sad, huh? We do not know when they had come to faith or what else was in their backgrounds. We do know that they used the opportunity for an offering in a deceitful and self-serving way, and this they did together. They were, in a higher term, complicit in this. So the story is told of um, a pastor sitting at his desk, and it's at the end of the year, and um, a local accountant called him up and said, is this Pastor so-and-so? Yes, it is. Well, one of your members has a listed on his uh, tax return that I'm gonna need to deal with in a few months that he's given $20,000 uh, to your church. Did he? Pastor said, well, I can tell that he will. All right. Before we take apart Ananias and Sapphira, I want to take a look at biblical offerings because I'm going to assume that in this group, not everybody has given gifts to ministry in the purest way. <coughs> I'm not talking about constantly. I'm talking about once or twice. Well, if the neighbor gave a thousand to the campaign, I'd, I'd better. Yeah, there's not a lot of joy in that, is there? Joyful giving to Christ? So what was the issue here with Ananias and Sapphira? We have no right to think that they were unbelievers. We have no right from the text to think that. To say, oh, they didn't believe in Jesus. I think they did. I don't think they were mature yet. Well, give me any congregation, we'll find those people, right? So what was this all about? Oh, they must have gone to hell. The Bible doesn't say that. So here again, I want to give, I want to give praise to Jane for thinking this through. This was years ago when we had little kids. And now our kids have little kids like some of you. She said, when you're in the grocery store, and your child is misbehaving in a very embarrassing, disruptive way. A good parent, a loving parent, a gracious parent might say, that's it, we're going home. I'm taking you home. You've embarrassed us enough. I'm taking you home. Oh, wow. That helped me. Because you've got to see the text. It doesn't say they were unbelievers. It doesn't say that they're going to hell. They had sinned. But that's hardly... All right. So they lied. They did give an offering. No. This is so significant. God says, my people will know that's not going to be allowed or tolerated or honored or accepted. I'm taking you home. That's my best understanding of Ananias and Sapphira because otherwise you say, who's next? I mean, who of us is next? To have done something in the name of Jesus with a little bit less than pure motives. Our hands go up, right? All of our hands go up. Even the way some of you serve on committees or organizations or boards over the years. You might do it grudgingly. You might come home a little bit angry at somebody. No. <laughs> I remember, I remember my dad, <clears throat> when there was a voters meeting, this is his home congregation where I grew up, and his father's home congregation and his father. I mean, so my dad was rooted in that congregation. <laughs> so we had to wait for dinner until the voters are over, <clears throat> I don't know, 1 o'clock, 1.30, he'd come in, <laughs> start taking off his tie, and he'd just, mutter, he'd just be muttering under his breath. Some people just don't know when to be quiet. And it's, 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 well, I don't think he had the purest heart uh, going to a voters meeting. 
He might have been better off serving Jesus by not going to a voters meeting, you know? So what did Ananias and Sapphira do that you and I have not done? There needed to be a line. And it needed to be understood that to follow Jesus is not just a popular thing. This is a godly thing and an eternal thing. Okay. We're going to get some hints in that when we go on to the, to the other verses in chapter 5. And I think we'll get there. All right, not quite yet. So let's take a look at offerings. Uh, Exodus 35, 29. Genesis, Exodus, second book of the Bible. Exodus 35, 29. All the Israelite men and women who were willing brought to the Lord free will offerings for all the work the Lord through Moses had commanded them to do. Then Moses said to the Israelites, See, the Lord has chosen Bezalel, son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, and he has filled him with the Spirit of God with skill, ability, and knowledge in all kinds of crafts, to make artistic designs for work in gold, silver, and bronze, to cut and set stones to work in wood and to engage in all kinds of artistic craftsmanship. And he has given both him and Aholiab, son of Ahisamach, of the tribe of Dan. That's an easy word, Dan. The ability to teach others. He has filled them with skill to do all kinds of work as craftsmen, designers, embroiderers, embroiderers in blue, <clears throat> purple and scarlet yarn and fine linen and weavers, all of the master craftsmen and designers. So Bezalel, a holy of an every skilled person to whom the Lord has given skill and ability to know how to carry out all the work of constructing the sanctuary or to do the work just as the Lord had commanded. Four. So all the skilled, cra I'm sorry, three, middle of verse three, and the people continued. See that? And the people continued to bring free will offerings morning after morning. So all the cra skilled craftsmen who were doing all the work on the sanctuary left their work and said to Moses, the people are bringing more than enough for doing the work the Lord commanded to be done. Then Moses gave an order, and they sent this word throughout the camp, no man or woman is to make anything else as an offering for the sanctuary. And so the people were strained from bringing more. That's the kind of financial campaign we're looking for here. <laughs> Go back, we got enough. We don't need any more. Go back. Is this a, that's an intriguing few verses in the book of Exodus. Go back. All right. Malachi chapter 3, last book of the Old Testament. Verse 8. <clears throat> Will a man rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how do we rob you? in tithes and offerings. You are under a curse, the whole nation of you, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have room enough for it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops and the vines in your fields will not cast their fruit, says the Lord Almighty, Then all the nations will call you blessed for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. All right? God says, you keep bringing me the tithe, I'm going to overwhelm you. I will overwhelm you with goodness. Okay. Is that um, a deal? No, it's not a deal. This is not, you're, you're not cutting this with a banker. So if I give you 10, will you give me 11? No, it's no deal. God will bless you the way he wants to bless you. I, now, some of you have heard this story probably five, four or five times. I'm going to say it again, because I know a few of you have never heard this story, and I think you'll like it. Because I think many of us are still afraid of the tithe and being generous. And the tithe, 10%, is God's wisdom, not command. I'll prove that to you by 2 Corinthians 8. It's not a command. It's God's wisdom. So uh, Jane and I were married in um, July 1974. You know that. And we moved a few weeks later to Springfield, Illinois. Completely alone. Completely on our own. And in, um, in an apartment, wasn't much. 
And, and we were getting ready for uh, worship the first Sunday we were there. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we didn't even know where to go to church. So we said, oh, I'll go to Trinity downtown, just like we have downtown here by the Capitol. So does Springfield. And we're almost out the door, and Jane said, what are we going to do for an offering? And I said, I think we should give one. <laughs> Brilliant. She said, I want to tithe. And I was scared of this woman. Because <laughs> we're committed now. I mean, there's no backing out. I said, oh, Jane, I don't know. We never talked about this before. Four years of dating, four years. Never talked about it. Here's how my parents taught me on the way to church. You got your envelope? Yeah, I got my envelope. We'll see that you do. Okay. That was it. But Jane's mother taught her how to tithe. And I said, I, oh, Jane, she said, it's in the Bible. Well, no, you know, it's checkmate. We're, okay. All right, so here's my life. So we did. All right. And from then on, because it's easy and it's joyful and he, over, he overwhelms us with blessing all right second corinthians chapter eight second corinthians eight <clears throat> verse one and now brothers we want you to know about the grace that god has given the macedonian churches out of the most severe trial, not just a trial, but a severe trial, not just a severe trial, but the most severe trial. Their overflowing joy, not just joy, overflowing joy. And their extreme poverty, not just poverty, extreme poverty, rolled up in rich generosity, not just generosity, rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able, and even beyond their ability. Well, what does that mean? It means God's at work. Entirely on their own. They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in the service of the saints, and they did not do as we expected. But they gave themselves first to the Lord and then to us in keeping with God's will. So we urged Titus, since he had earlier made a beginning, to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. But just as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness and in your love for us, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. I am not commanding you, <coughs> pardon me, <clears throat> but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. All right, so 2 Corinthians 8 and also chapter 9 a little bit. We don't have time for that today. But 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 settles the heart. You don't have to do this. But there's godly wisdom in here. And there's benefit for the kingdom here. And there's opportunity here to get to the next level. It's right here, Paul says. And I got to tell you what I've seen in the Macedonian Christians. Boy, they didn't have much. And they just overwhelmed us with their generosity. Okay. Next page. Page, backside. I want to talk about a seeming contradiction. <clears throat> Pardon me. Let's go back to Acts 5. <clears throat> Verse 13 and 14. No one else dared join them. And that seems to be a direct result of Ananias and Sapphira's deaths. And how everybody would have known what that was about. So now, I'm interested in following Jesus. But I'm not sure I'm going to take that risk. Right? So, I guess... If you stop at verse 13 and say, well, I guess the church is not going to grow anymore. 14. 
Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. So the seeming harshness of God upon Ananias and Sapphira, which I believe was an act of love for the sake of the church, seemed to put a halt to growth, but only for a short time, because the truth of Christ continued to touch hearts. That's a pretty fascinating thing to consider, in my opinion. All right, I didn't write this down. In the early Christian church, and Pastor Reed can, can confirm this with me if I'm right or wrong. I know I'm right, but I just want to be accurate. Because I'm not sure if it was the first century, the first two or three centuries, for a member to go through what we would call adult instruction. It was like a year. And one of the reasons it took a year was not because they had more to learn than we do, but because the leaders growing out of the apostles, you know, the apostles had to give over leadership to others. That's what we call the early church fathers. <clears throat> they said, this is not just a club. This is not just an organization. This could cost you your life. In our world right now, there is a high level of mistrust or hatred against what we're doing, follow Christ. And historically, that was true. So to bring in, so we say, oh, boy, I love this idea of serving Jesus. Can, can I be ready in five weeks? Uh, no, it's going to take a year. Because we want to test your faith. We want to talk to you about living for Christ in this world. And even though following Christ gives you eternal life, the security of life and salvation you may be suffering in this world because of your faith in Jesus. Are you ready? That's how that all went. And often then, they would delay baptism, which is not biblical. I think that's where the church starts to get it wrong. Then they would delay baptism often until Easter Saturday. And then they would have all the new members baptized Easter Saturday, and then resurrection celebration would be that much more, in their opinion, better than ever. We don't delay baptism because in Scripture it was never delayed, ever. It was never done in an official worship setting, ever. So we want to make sure we're mindful of that. But in those first four centuries, those are some of the ways that came upon the people of God. And it's because of what we see here, um, and you're going to see it throughout the book of Acts, you might end up suffering by following Jesus. You ready for that? And that would what would be asked of, of the uh, people coming into uh, the, the Christian faith. All right. This is an exceptional look at the seeming paradox of the seriousness and attractiveness of faith in Christ Jesus. He is to be loved and trusted, but fully understanding of the possible cost. All right, I just talked about that. This is going to be risky, but Jesus is worth it, and many times over. All right, now let's build on that theme, and let's go to Matthew chapter 10 because Jesus has already taught this. Matthew chapter 10, verse 37 to 42. And of course I went to Mark, Matthew 10. <clears throat> Anyone who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And anyone who does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. And you can read the other verses later. Matthew chapter 16, <clears throat> 24 to 26. And this is right after Peter had rebuked Jesus. 
Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will find it. What good will it be for man if he gains the whole world, yet forfeits his soul? Or what can man give in exchange for his soul? And let's go to Luke chapter 14. Verses 25 through 35. When we look at parables, we often know it's a parable. Say, oh, that's a parable. Good Samaritan, lost coin, lost sheep, prodigal son. But there are other teachings of Jesus that have parable type format. There's always a story to tell a spiritual truth, right? That's a parable. A common earthly story to reveal a spiritual truth or reality. I don't know how many times I've heard pastors use these verses in regard to a, a building program for a church. Well, we've got to have three quarters to build, and Jesus said that. No, Jesus is using these teachings as a parable for spiritual truths. Are you prepared fully to follow? Have you considered the cost to follow Jesus? That's what we read here. All right. 28. <clears throat> Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Will he not first sit down and estimate the cost to see if he has enough money to complete it? For if, if he lays the foundation and is not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule him, saying, this fellow began to build and was not able to finish. 31. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Will he not first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he's not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, any of you who does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. Count the cost. Can you count the cost of following Jesus? That's the parable. Well, two parables. That's the teaching. And it matches up with what we see elsewhere. Okay. Are you counting the cost to follow Jesus? So we have, in Acts chapter 5, apparently many men and women said, mm, yes, right? Because there, there seemed to have been a stall for just a short time. We don't know how long it was, but they were afraid. All right, let's go back to Acts 5. Let's, go, let's look at those words again. Acts 5. <clears throat> verse 12, uh, verse 12b. All the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colony. That's part of the temple. No one else there joined them. And that seems to have been a response or reaction to Ananias and Sapphira and the word that went out. Yeah, okay. Love what you're doing. Not joining. Okay. Even though they were highly regarded by the people. Love what you're doing. Keep it up. As for me, I don't know. I better think this one through. And then they did think it through. Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. So I, I, I think we see in that a reality. Of, I'm, I'm going to take this seriously. Oh, I'll, okay, I'll join your church. A fiancé says to his, to his fiancé, okay, I, I guess I'll become a Lutheran. I mean, what's the worst that can happen, you know? Am I right? Yeah, I'll join. Do I have to go every week? No, just join. Just come with me a couple times. Well, I can do that. And maybe then the Holy Spirit grabs that guy. And I've seen that happen. And he's not only there. He's sold out. He's excited about Jesus. But when he first got in there, he says, oh, okay, 
can't be that hard. <clears throat> All right. Questions, comments, cutting remarks. Anything? Because we're going to look at this hymn. I fully support contemporary worship. It just doesn't touch my heart. Because there are a lot of contemporary hymns that are 400 years old. We, set, we, we, we read this in my Wednesday morning men's class because it fit there too. And I, you know what? We're going to do it here. Let me just read these words and see if it sounds like 2024 to you. <clears throat> Pardon me. What is the world to me with all its vaunted pleasure? When you, and you alone, Lord Jesus, are my treasure. You only, dearest Lord, my soul's delight shall be. You are my peace, my rest. What is the world to me? The world seeks to be praised and honored by the mighty. Is, is that not contemporary? My goodness. Yet never once reflects, <clears throat> pardon me, <clears throat> that they are frail and flighty. But what I truly prize above all things is he, my Jesus, he alone. What is the world to me? The world seeks after wealth and all that mammon offers, yet never is content, though gold should fill its coffers. I have a higher good. Content with it, I'll be. My Jesus is my wealth. What is the world to me? What is the world to me? My Jesus is my treasure. My life, my health, my wealth, my friend, my love, my pleasure. My joy, my crown, my all, my bliss eternally. Once more than I declare, what is the world to me? Georg Pfefferkorn. There's a German name for you. <clears throat> Georg Pfefferkorn wrote those words. And I thought, my goodness. It's just beautiful expression of faith in Christ. Yeah, I think it's very contemporary. All right, any other comments? Aaron, you want to keep talking a little bit? No? So we, hang on, Nancy. Hang on, Charlene. We need an operator of the camera, back up for Dennis and coffee, and a yeah, tennis taker. We need an AT. All right, Nancy, then Charlene. What is the world to me? I think, I think the German is was frage ich nach der Welt. And, and in German that would loosely be uh, what questions do I have of the world? And the answer is none. I got, I got no questions of the world. Yeah, was frage ich, anybody have it? Did anybody bring your hymnal? Was frage ich nach der Welt? Anybody help me with that? So you know if I'm right or wrong on that. I'm right. Charlene. It seems to me that those, that verse 13 would keep the church from becoming... Back in Acts 5. Go ahead. It would keep the church from what? Becoming a social thing. Thank you. Yeah. There's some serious thought. It would, Charlene suggested it would keep the church from becoming just a social gathering of people who want more friends or... Oh, they got barn dances at that church? Yeah, I'll join that church. Listen, this may cost you your life to follow Jesus. Are you ready? And there are people today around the world who are facing this, following Christ in different, gen different cultures, different, different languages, different parts of the world. I mean, it's real. Thanks. Yeah. Roger. Nice. To find your own way of serving the mission of Christ in your own way is what you're saying, Roger? Yeah, just to be encouragers. 
Yeah, Roger said, you know, Barnabas, uh, and he wasn't the main speaker, Paul was, but he was, his presence was such an encouragement, and every one of us can be that way. See, if you cannot speak like angels, if you, no, if you, gotta, if you cannot speak like Paul, of Jesus, you can say he died for all. If you cannot rouse the wicked with the judgments that threat alarms, you can be like faithful Aaron holding up the prophet's arms. What? That's a different verse. <laughs> you can be like faithful Aaron holding up the prophet's arms. Look it up. <laughs> We're all going to go home and look at our hymnals. Anything else? Okay. If you want to step up and be a volunteer, talk to Aaron, right? You'll be here for a few minutes. All right, let's pray. Lord Jesus, go with us now into this world keeping our faith strong and vibrant, encouraging and uplifting, courageous and hope-filled. We praise you for what we've learned today. And give us always a desire for you and your word. For your sake, amen. All right, see you.